Welcome and good morning to our presentation this morning on instructional strategies for acquisition and maintenance of customized job tasks by Dr. Tim Rison of Utah State University. Uh, some of you who were with us, uh, I think uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, uh, Dr. Reeson had a, another presentation for us around customized employment. And so he's following up with an additional uh, discussion uh, this morning. A couple of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have a question uh, that comes to you during the presentation, please put that in the Q&A box. You may also uh, uh, ask a question at the conclusion when we will have our question and answer phase. So either enter one in uh, during, uh, if it occurs to you while you're watching the presentation and add one as well as uh, we're doing the Q&A. If, if you wanna check the chat box, there will be a link for the PowerPoint PDF uh, for Dr. Reeson's presentation, and that will be put up periodically as the chat box scrolls. A uh, couple of other pieces. Uh, on the Q&A, after Dr. Reeson is done, uh, Heidi decker Maurer, who you see on your screen with Stout Boak Rehab Institute, uh, and again, I'm Terry Donovan with the Stout Boak Rehab Institute. Vicki Brook will be joining Heidi uh, from, uh, uh, Vicki is from Virginia Commonwealth University. She will be joining Heidi to answer your questions. And that will occur again after the end of Dr. Reeson's presentation. Uh, at the end of the uh, uh, near, either at, after the questions are all sort of done or uh, at about 25 after the hour, uh, Jennifer gunlock Platt with Stout will talk about how you will get, how you can obtain CRC credits for this as well as some other pertinent information. The, all of our webinars are recorded. If you find this webinar particularly useful for you, uh, please go to the Project E3 site, uh, join our communities of practice. All of the recordings that we've done over the last year and into the rest of this year um, are available and will be available there. You can watch those recordings, take the evaluation and obtain a CRC credit for that as well. But there's just some wonderful content that we've presented over the year, especially uh, content that had, some of the content which has focused on persons with disabilities who are living in poverty. So with that, uh, we will get started. Uh, Dr. Reeson's uh, presentation is approximately 45 minutes and then uh, Heidi decker Maurer and Vicki Brook will come on to answer your questions. So again, uh, if questions occur to you during the webinar, put that in the Q&A chat box for the PowerPoint PDF. If by chance you put a question in the chat box, don't worry, um, we'll figure it out and make sure we get to that. So with that, we will start the presentation and thanks again for joining us this morning. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Reeson. I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of Special Education and Rehabilitation. And I also have an appointment in the Center for Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University. Today I'm gonna to talk about uh, instructional strategies for the acquisition and maintenance of customized job tasks. So before I get into talking about instructional strategies, I just wanna provide a little bit of uh, background about why uh, employment of people with disabilities is important and why developing uh, instructional supports that use uh, evidence-based practices uh, is really important as well. So we all know that promoting meaningful pathways to employment is an important advocacy, policy, and research priority. And one of the reasons why this is such an important policy and research priority is because of the perennial poor outcomes for people with disabilities. So if you've seen the employment data out there, it doesn't look very promising, in fact, uh, if you look at the American Community Survey, approximately 35% of people with disabilities are employed. And if you distill that data down a little bit further uh, and look at uh, populations such as intellectual developmental disabilities, we see that roughly 18% of people uh, with intellectual developmental disabilities are employed in competitive integrated employment, whereas roughly 80% of uh, people, that same population, uh, is employed or receive services in uh, facility-based work and non-work settings. So we're not doing a great job in terms of promoting uh, employment for people with disabilities. So we're continually searching for ways that are gonna improve these outcomes and get us, out, get us away from those pretty poor 
uh, the poor percentages for people with disabilities. Customized employment is one, path, one of those pathways that emerged in the early 2000s, and it was really designed to support people with more significant disabilities in finding uh, meaningful employment. And it was codified in, uh, in 2014 when the Rehabilitation, Re Rehabilitation Act was amended in WIOA. So now customized employment is an important service provision uh, for uh, uh, people with disabilities. And it's really designed to help, uh, help people with disabilities uh, find a job that's meaningful, that's based on his or her strengths and interests, but also aligns with, uh, aligns with the needs of the employers. So when we're doing customized employment well, uh, we engage in a nice discovery process that really figures out what a person uh, would like to do in terms of employment, and then we match those needs to the employer. But what we're finding when we're implementing uh, customized employment and other uh, employment support strategies is that we have an absence of highly trained employment specialists to deliver uh, these instructional strategies well. This means that you know, people with disabilities, particularly those with more significant disabilities, are going to employment settings and not rapidly learning uh, employment skills uh, quickly. And so this creates a problem both for the person with a disability and the employer because we want individuals to perform uh, these skills rapidly, uh, rapidly and learn these skills. So uh, when we're implementing customized employment, it becomes paramount that employment specialists really understand how to deliver systematic instruction and the strategies that I'm going to be talking about uh, in this webcast. Furthermore, we also know that uh, when people are delivering instructional supports to people with disabilities, that we often use inappropriate prompting strategies during training for acquisition of customized employment tasks. So th these uh, inappropriate prompting strategies lead to uh, a sense of prompt dependency for people with disabilities. So what happens when we're using these inappropriate prompting strategies, people with disabilities then become dependent on uh, uh, employment specialists to help them complete uh, a customized job task or an employment task. And so if we are looking at improving these employment outcomes for people with the most significant disabilities, we really need to make sure that we're using these strategies that work. We're using these strategies that are going to promote a rapid acquisition of a, of a specific employment task. So we know when we're implementing instruction in customized employment that the success of, customized, uh, of a customized job is really contingent on a number of factors. First and foremost, and I've already kind of alluded to this, is that we're looking at that match of the individual skills to the customized job task. So this means that during the discovery process, we really look at the strengths and interests of the individuals. And during that process, we're also looking at how best to teach this individual and how we can uh, utilize specific strategies so they could rapidly acquire uh, the skills to uh, engage in a customized job task. We also know that when we're implementing instruction, we have to use evidence-based practices for teaching uh, the acquisition and maintenance of customized job tasks. Uh, we don't want to use anecdotal strategies. We want to use strategies that we know work. And so there are a number of different uh, systematic instructional strategies that uh, one can use in terms of teaching, uh, in terms of teaching a person a new skill. And I'm going to focus on a couple of them, a uh, couple of these uh, skill, these strategies in today's webinar. But this, the, the application of evidence-based practices is really one of the things that we uh, that is missing in terms of promoting better outcomes for individuals with disabilities. We need to ensure that folks understand the evidence-based practices for teaching and they understand how to apply them in employment settings. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of these in, uh, instructional strategies, but I first want to review uh, some guidelines that are kind of important in terms of selecting uh, the most effective uh, instructional strategy to use in an employment setting. And first and foremost, uh, as I already alluded, we want to use effective and efficient strategies. We want to use those strategies that are going to produce a result. So this, once again, takes us back to the discovery phase and takes us back to when we're learning about the strengths, interests, and needs of an individual. We really have to figure out 
uh, the ways that the, that individual is going to respond and the ways uh, that we're going to utilize some form of uh, instructional strategy that's going to really increase uh, the likelihood that the person will learn a new task or learn a customized employment task. We also want to ensure that uh, when we're teaching that we select uh, instructional strategies that, you know, that result in fewer instructional trials. So when we're teaching an individual with a disability to do a new task, we don't want to spend forever teaching that task. We want to engage in uh, instruction that's where we only have a few instructional trials, a rapid acquisition, that promotes fewer errors and that we have less trainer involvement. So the quicker we can train an individual to do an employment task, the better, uh, the better the outcome for the individual with a disability and the better the outcome for the employer. So we really want to make sure that we're utilizing these effective and efficient strategies. Second, we want to use uh, less restrictive and less intrusive strategies. So we want to get away from strategies that impinge, demoralize, stigmatize, or intrude on a person with a disability. So when you watch somebody who's using these strategies, uh, response prompting strategies effectively, and who is uh, implementing a really solid systematic instruction programming, it, it really is effortless in some respects. You can't really tell that they're doing it. So we want to make sure that we're using these least restrictive, less intrusive strategies when we're teaching uh, a person with a disability to perform a new skill or a new task. We also want to ensure that we're facilitating learner-directed strategies to the extent possible. So uh, it's really important that we, you know, during the discovery process, that we figure out how that person will best learn. And are there certain compensatory strategies that we can implement when uh, helping, uh, when teaching a, a individual with a disability to new, a new uh, task? We also want to ensure that instruction leads to independent performance. That's the point of uh, teaching an individual is so that they can independently perform that, uh, that specific task. We also want to ensure that instruction is individualized and effective for that person. So you can see a pattern here that everything that we do in terms of instruction is tied back to what we've learned during the discovery process of how this person will learn, what's, what strategies they're going to respond to, right? And then finally, we want to make sure that we're collecting performance data. And this is an area that I see in my work that we aren't necessarily good at doing. A lot of uh, employment specialists uh, don't collect performance data on outcomes for an individual with disability. And in my mind, when we're, when we're teaching an individual a new skill, it's really important that we collect that data so we know if that acquisition is occurring. If we don't have good solid data, then we can't really determine whether or not that person is learning, uh, learning a specific employment task. So a couple of things that I would like to review before we get into, uh, get into specific instructional strategies is like what we're teaching and, and the context for teaching. So when we start teaching an individual a skill, there are two types of behaviors or skills that we commonly refer to, one of which is a discrete skill or behavior. And this skill has a clear beginning and an end, and it's typically a, only a single response. So that might be something like ladling some sauce on a pizza. That's one single response, right? But those aren't, we typically don't do those in employment settings. What we do is uh, these skills or behaviors are, are often comp uh, comprised of a complex behavior chain. And these complex behavior chains are a sequence of these discrete behaviors in which the, com uh, the completion of each response is a cue to engage in the next response. So it's a chain of events that leads to a larger outcome. And these complex behavior chains are what we do in employment settings. So they're the core routines that we see in a customized job. And uh, we use task, uh, task an analysis to really pinpoint uh, what an individual uh, needs to do in order to complete that specific job task. So that task analysis, when we're thinking about instruction and thinking about how we're going to implement instruction in a customized employment setting, is really the starting point of, of the instructional, of systematic instruction. So we, when we're working with an individual, we identify these core routines that an individual would do in a customized, uh, a customized setting. And then if an individual is having difficulty implementing any of these core routines or performing any of these core routines or tasks, then we develop a task analysis for teaching purposes. So the task analysis helps us 
really wrap our heads around what that person needs to do in order to perform that specific task successfully. So when we are developing a task analysis, it's oriented around the accomplishment of a single task within a routine, right? And then we organize and sequence steps of a task for teaching purposes, meaning we want to make sure this is logical and that it makes sense when we create uh, our specific task analysis. That these discrete steps, you know, if an individual engages in each one of these discrete steps of the task analysis, it's going to uh, result in the completion of that specific task. We also use a task analysis to promote consistent and reliable training. So this really a task analysis is a, a blueprint for the employment specialist and for the person with a disability so we can really understand what that individual needs to do in order to be successful on the job. And finally, we, we can use a, a, a task analysis as a data collection system. So going back to my previous point that if we're going to be teaching an individual a skill, and as, especially when we're looking at indiv individuals with significant support needs or individuals with the most significant disabilities, this data collection becomes paramount, that we really need to ensure uh, that we have a reliable system to track what's happening in terms of performance because we want to see that independent, independent performance on the, it, it, at the customized employment site setting. And uh, a task analysis it allows us to do that. So this is an example of a task analysis uh, that uh, I created uh, in terms of, uh, for a study that uh, uh, we were looking at different prompting strategies in an employment, in an employment setting. And this was for making a pan pizza. Uh, at, a, at a local restaurant. And so you can see that when we're developing a task analysis, we highlight the stimulus material, or the stimulus that cues the individual to respond, and then we highlight the task that the individual would need to do uh, each one of the steps in the task analysis. So the stimulus is what cues an individual to perform the, ta the step in the task. And so on, the, uh, on this, uh, task analysis, there are uh, ten, 10 specific steps. And so the first step is pretty uh, straightforward. It's just place a square deep dish pan on the prep station. So that individual would uh, set that pan on the deep dish on the prep station, and then they start going down the steps of the task analysis. So from an instructional standpoint, what, how I'm going to use this specific task analysis is it's going to allow me to highlight perhaps where the individual is having trouble. So rather than teaching the whole skill of making a pan pizza in this example, I can simply highlight the step where the individual is having difficulty and teach that specific step. And so when, when we highlight or we isolate where an individual is having trouble, it's going to help us develop an instructional program to rapidly teach that person that skill. And the person will acquire that skill much quicker if we just simply you know, have the person repeat each one of these steps and we hope that through uh, repeated trials that the person's going to complete, uh, complete the task of making a pizza. From an instructional uh, standpoint, I want to go in and highlight, figure out where the problem is, and then teach that specific skill. So how do we use a task analysis during this acquisition of these new customized job tasks? Well, typically what we do, and when we're when we're thinking about systematic instruction and how to implement uh, instruction is we use response prompting and fading. So this is a really important thing to dis uh, component to discuss because going back to the previous, previous slide, what we know about people with disabilities, particularly those with more significant disabilities, those with significant support needs, is that they become dependent on the prompts that an employment specialist delivers. So they, they, uh, they may know how to do the task, but they wait for those prompts. And once again, this is a problem of not using uh, instructional strategies effectively. So when we're starting to teach and implement instruction in customized employment, we want to ensure that we're using appropriate response prompting and fading strategies. So response prompting and fading are uh, basically when uh, behaviors of a person or other type of stimulus material that increases the probability that a person with a disability will, will engage in that correct behavior. So going back to the pizza example that I was uh, talking about earlier. So uh, when we're making a pan pizza or any individuals making a pan pizza, 
hopefully that person will recognize the stimulus that cues him or her to move to the next step. But oftentimes, a person doesn't recognize that stimulus, and we as an instruct instructor serve as that stimulus by providing a prompt. Once we provide that prompt, that person moves to that next step on the task analysis. Now, when we're teaching a person a new skill during this acquisition phase, what we want to see happen is what we call a transfer of stimulus control, meaning that the person starts to recognize the, the stimulus in the natural environment, and they no longer need our prompt for that individual to complete that task. So this transfer is really important, and it's a really important piece of this instructional piece. That transfer of stimulus control uh, is what we want to see happening in any form of instructional uh, context. So when we're providing response prompt and fading, we're gradually fading out our prompts uh, so that that individual can engage in that task independently. So we deliver specific prompts concurrently or after the presentation of a uh, discriminative stimulus. That's, that, stimuli, that stimuli that that cues that individual to uh, engage in that specific step. And also, it's designed to reduce errors. So when we're using response, response prompting and fading, and we're doing it correctly, it really is an errorless learning strategy. So we want the person to be successful in completing these specific job tasks. So this is an example of a prompt hierarchy. And uh, uh, if you've worked in the disability field for uh, long enough, you've probably seen something analogous to this. This is something that we use all the time in terms of teaching. So the prompt hierarchy is just a, uh, is just a hierarchy of prompts that we utilize in order to uh, teach or assist an individual uh, to recognize that stimulus that cues him or her to engage in that step. So it go, the prompt hierarchy goes from least, ex, least uh, intrusive to most intrusive. So an example up on the top would be a gesture. So that would be something like pointing to, uh, pointing to something. Uh, an indirect verbal would be, hey, what's next? You need to be engaged in something without telling the person uh, what they need to be doing. And then a direct verbal, uh, the direct verbal is, hey, you need to ladle the sauce on the pizza. A model is showing the individual uh, how to uh, model or how to uh, ladle the sauce on the pizza. And then a partial physical would be maybe you're uh, you know, giving a little prime to get the person's arm to move over to ladle the pizza. And then a full physical would be uh, you know, hand over hand. And I, I always have work off this assumption that most of the time in an employment setting, when we're prompting an individual to complete a task, we're only going to be using a gesture, an indirect verbal, a direct verbal, and perhaps a model. The only time uh, we ever or I've ever used a partial physical or a full physical if I'm shaping a behavior and I'm working on fine motor skills or anything. So those partial, partial physical and full physical isn't to force somebody to do something. So in an employment setting, going back to what I was talking about in terms of instructional uh, 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 guidelines for instruction, least intrusive, we want to use the least intrusive strategies that produce the result. And most of the time, that gesture, indirect verbal, direct verbal, and model will suffice. So the guidelines um, for utilizing these specific prompts in any form of instructional uh, format is that we want to select those least intrusive but effective prompts. I've already stated this, the importance of this. So we want to use the prompt that's going to get the job done, but it's not very intrusive. Okay? We can combine prompts, so we can use what's called a prompt blend. Uh, to get an individual, so it might be, uh, I could use like a gesture and an indirect verbal as like pointing to something and saying, hey, what's next? We also want to use natural prompts, prompts that, that are natural, that naturally occur. Uh, we also want to make sure that we provide prompts only when the person is attending. So this is an important point. If, I, if, if I'm teaching somebody a new skill, I want to ensure that they are attending to the skill that we're teaching. If they're not, it, it, you can't teach that individual that specific skill. So you need to ensure that the person is attending when we're teaching. That we want to provide prompts in a very support, supportive, instructive matter, manner, and then fade out those prompts as soon as possible, because we do not want to see uh, an, an individual in any context be dependent on uh, a, pro, a provider or an instructor. 
other couple important pieces here uh, that, that I think are, we need to mention is something about reinforcement. So when I'm working in an employment context or teaching an individual a new skill, reinforcement is really important. We all like to be reinforced, right? So when I'm teaching somebody a new skill, I want to make sure that I'm providing consistent and reliable reinforcement. And that is just positive verbal reinforcement. That's the only reinforcement I really need to provide uh, in an employment setting. That's natural. That's the way, it sh that's the way it, all of us are reinforced is through that kind of re that verbal reinforcement. You're doing a great job. Hey, that looked really good what you did. Unfortunately, what, I, what I've seen throughout my career and what I still see happening is that we oftentimes use food or token economies to get people uh, with intellectual developmental disabilities, people with more significant support needs to engage in a task. And I, I'm going to tell you all or really reinforce that we shouldn't be doing that. We should not be using food or any form of token economies to get an individual to engage in the task. So if we've done our job well during discovery, you know, the task in, of, um, in and of themselves should be reinforcement because we figured out what that person wants to do and we shouldn't have to use food or token economies to get the person to engage in that task. We should just simply provide positive verbal reinforcement when, they, uh, when that individual engages in, in, uh, in completion of a specific customized employment task. Error correction. So when we all make mistakes and all of us make mistakes during instruction, people with disabilities are no different. So when we are uh, teaching an individual, we want to make sure that we are uh, engaged in appropriate error correction. So when I talk about error correction, it's not punitive. We're not like punishing the person for making an error. We're just simply telling the person that they didn't complete that target behavior correctly. So going back to the task analysis, if they didn't complete that step correctly of lad ladling the, the sauce on the pizza dough, then I have to correct it. And I have to say, oh, you didn't do it right. Let's try it again. And then I just repeat the step. That's all I do during that error correction, during the error correction phases. So reinforcement, positive verbal reinforcement is all we need to provide to an individual. No food, no token economies, and good solid error correction. So this is kind of a framework for instruction. Now I want to get into a couple of instructional strategies that are based on, on empirical evidence. So there's been research on each one of these specific strategies. And I, uh, so I'll review these, uh, um, the, each one of these strategies uh, so you have a good understanding of how we might implement these in an, in an employment setting. And there are a number of other response prompting strategies as well. I chose to focus on uh, only two of these strategies, one of which is a constant time delay, and the other is called a system of least prompts. And each one of these have been, uh, data has been collected and research has been published on the efficacy of each one of these, uh, each one of these uh, instructional strategies. So constant time delay is a fairly simple strategy that can be utilized in an employment setting uh, with very little effort. Take some time to kind of think through how you want to implement the strategy and develop the task analysis. But once all that's done, you can really uh, develop a constant time delay procedure pretty, uh, uh, pretty easily. And the specific steps to a constant time delay are first, you want to identify what cues that individual to respond, right? So if I'm making a pizza, uh, I, I got to identify how I'm going to get that person to engage in that activity. And then I also have to identify the controlling prompt. So the controlling prompt is the prompt that consistently and reliably gets a person to complete a specific uh, task on a task analysis or step on a task analysis. So we have uh, non-controlling prompts and controlling prompts. The controlling prompt is the one that I know will always get that person to engage in that uh, specific step, to complete that specific step with uh, consistently. Okay. I also want to assess the individual's ability to wait for a prompt. So when we're utilizing a constant time delay, we're going to insert a predetermined amount of seconds before we deliver that prompt. So we allow that person to uh, respond before we provide that specific prompt. So we need to determine, once again, going back to the discovery process, 
what that might look like. I can't, like if we're going to utilize a, a, a constant time delay, I want to know uh, that individual's ability to wait for that specific prompt. And then we also utilize what's called a zero second delay trial in a constant time delay to ensure that the person can engage in the, in the steps that we want him or her to engage in. So the zero second time delay, we, we, typically we do two or three trials at a zero second time delay just to ensure that the person has, uh, can complete each one of those steps in the task analysis. And then once we've uh, established the zero second delay trial, then we move to the, uh, the a three second time delay. And we determine that length of the delay interval. Typically it's two or three seconds. So when I'm implementing a uh, constant time delay, I provide that task direction. I say, hey, it's time to make a pizza. And then I insert three seconds. I just count to myself, one, two, three, and I provide that controlling prompt, that prompt that's always going to elicit the response that I want. So in this case, it would be a verbal prompt, just punch down the pizza dough. So there are different responses that we can see in a constant time delay program. The first is correct responses, right? So we can have unprompted correct responses and prompted correct responses. And an unprompted correct response is the individual makes a correct response before that controlling prompt is delivered. So if I say, hey, it's time to make a pizza, and that person go, uh, immediately goes and uh, punches down the dough on that first step of the task analysis, I would mark that as an unprompted correct response. But if I say, hey, it's time to make pizza, and I wait the three second and I deliver that, uh, that controlling prompt, and then the person makes the correct response after the, that prompt is delivered, that is a prompted correct response. So when we see these happening, and in terms of an uh, instructional, uh, instructional approach, we respond to each one of these responses with just that verbal re reinforcement, hey, you did a really good job. Uh, when there are certain errors that we can see in a constant time delay program, <clears throat> one of which is an unprompted error, so these unprompted errors, errors, the individual responds incorrectly before the controlling prompt is delivered, and, or the individual responds incorrectly after the controlling prompt is delivered. So when this happens, you know, uh, we, we want to just implement that error correction procedure that I talked about earlier, meaning I say, hey, you didn't do that step right, let's try it again, and I just error corrected. And then, of course, we can have no response errors. So those no responses are the, the individual just doesn't, uh, respond after that controlling prompt. And in these cases, I might want to go back and look at that controlling prompt and m I might have to go up one level higher in order to elicit that response that I need. So this is an example of a data sheet. It might be hard to see on the screen. But I, I, all of you have the PowerPoint so you can download it. But this data sheet, you know, takes the steps of the task analysis and then I'm just simply tracking prompted, uh, prompted correct responses and unprompted correct responses. And then I calculate a percentage at the bottom of the data sheet. So it's a very simple system, uh, just uh, simply marking what an individual did in terms of prompted correct responses and unprompted correct responses. So this serves as your data collection system. Then you can start graphing the data. So in this uh, example, I've just created a simple uh, line graph of what, what's happened in terms of that person's acquisition of building that pizza. So I collect baseline and then what I want to see happening is the unprompted uh, correct response has an accelerating trend line and the prompted, uh, the prompted correct response has a decelerating trend line. So once that ac acceleration happens, I can reliably say that learning is occurring and I start fading out my responses. So constant time delay is a really effective way, a really easy way to teach an individual a new employment task in a customized employment setting. Uh, it, it's simple to implement. Uh, with little effort, you can create nice data sheets and uh, a nice data collection systems to implement the customized employment or the constant time delay, pardon me. The second one uh, strategy is called the system of least prompts. This one is a little more, uh, has a little more uh, detail to it in that we have to use at least three levels of the prompt hierarchy. So when I'm implementing a system of least to most prompts, I'm, I have to use uh, three specific levels 
uh, in order to effectively use the system of least, uh, least prompts. And that first level in that prompt hierarchy is independent, like that, the opportunity to respond without uh, prompting. And the second and subsequent levels include prompts that are arranged from the least intrusive to the most intrusive. So using this system, we start with giving the person the opportunity to respond without a prompt. And then we start moving up the hierarchy from the least intrusive to the most intrusive until that person uh, engages in that uh, behavior that we want. So the steps of a least to most uh, prompting program is that we need to identify that stimulus that cues the employee to respond. So is it that task direction? Is that me saying, hey, it's time to make a pizza? Or is that material, like seeing the pizza on the prep station and the pre-made pizza dough or whatever, and that person has to go over and, and start building those specific pizzas? So we really need to make sure that that person understands or we know what that stimulus is to get that individual to respond, okay? And that they're attending during instruction. Then we select the number of levels in the hierarchy. So we have to make sure that we're, uh, that we're, uh, uh, that we have an appropriate level of uh, levels in that specific hier hierarchy and that we identify that controlling prompt. Once again, that prompt that's always, that will always and reliably get that person to respond. That's gonna be the most intrusive level, and then we provide least intrusive levels uh, prior to going to that controlling prompt, okay? So when we're thinking about this, we really have to think about the complexity of the tasks that an individual is engaged in. So chain tasks, you know, you know we might need to use a couple more uh, levels on the hierarchy to really get a person to respond, simply because that task might be com uh, fairly complex. We also have to look at the employer characteristics. So once again, this goes back to the discovery process about how a person is going to, going to most effectively learn. Will they respond to specific prompts? How do they respond to specific prompts? And these are really important pieces of developing a really solid, uh, a really solid uh, employment training program in terms of customized employment. So steps to uh, developing a least to most prompting uh, employment uh, instructional program. Select the type of prompts uh, to be used, and I've already kind of reinforced this. This is based on what you know about how the employee will learn. And again, this goes back to discovery. So everything that we're talking about always goes back to that discovery process. So you're really learning about what makes that person tick. You're really learning about how they're gonna respond best in, in, a, in different settings. And then we sequence prompts from the least assistance to the most, ass most assistance. So we always start with that, least, that least, uh, least intrusive prompt, and then we move up to that controlling prompt, the most, most intrusive that's going to uh, reliably elicit the response that we're looking at. And then we determine that appropriate response in an interval. So like a constant time delay, I'm gonna insert a couple seconds uh, uh, before I deliver the prompt. So before I move up that hierarchy, I wait two seconds. And then if the individual still doesn't do uh, what I would like him or her to do or what's required of the task, I wait an, uh, an two more seconds before I deliver the next prompt and so on and so on until I get to that controlling prompt that's going to reliably, uh, reliably result in the person completing that task. So like constant time delay, there's some kind of uh, rules to responding to correct responses. So uh, when, I, when an individual responds correctly, we follow unprompted and prompted correct responses with that verbal reinforcement. So you can see that this idea of verbal reinforcement is really important. Hey, you did a great job. That was a great job ladling the sauce on the pizza or whatever the task might be. And then during acquisition, you know, when the person's learning that skill, that, act, those, that important acquisition phase, that we're reinforcing immediately after each correct response. And as they start to acquire the skill, we gradually re reinforce that, uh, gradually fade that reinforcement to natural levels. So we wanna, uh, we don't want the person to just wait for our reinforcement all the time. The reinforcement should be uh, completing the task. And once again, make sure that that reinforcement is age appropriate. Uh, and it's just a, hey, you're doing a good job, great job, completing that specific task. And then responding to incorrect responses. So when a person's 
doesn't respond correctly on the task analysis. We interrupt, interrupt that incorrect response or, not, or no response and deliver the next prompt, the next level on the prompt hierarchy. So I would stop the, stop the response, or if there was no response, and then I'd just go to that next level on that prompt hierarchy until it elicits that correct response. So this is just an example of how, uh, how you would utilize a uh, least to most strategy and kind of an illustration. Hopefully it makes sense. Uh, the first level, when I'm implementing a, an instructional program for an individual with a disability in a, in a customized setting or a supported employment setting or whatever the setting may be, that I present that target stimulus. So going back to the pizza, I say, hey, Jack, it's time to make a pizza. And I wait, if I predetermine that at the three second interval is what I'm gonna use, I wait three seconds. I just count to myself, one, two, three. If there's a correct response, I provide a verbal reinforcement, and then I move to the next step on the task analysis. If there's not a correct response, however, then I go to the second level, right? I say, hey, Jack, it's time to make a pizza, and then I go to that uh, the least, the next least intrusive prompt. So I'd say, hey, what's next? Which would be an indirect verbal. And if there was a correct response, I go back over to the correct response column and then go to the next step on the task analysis. But if there's not a correct response, I've waited my three seconds, then I go to the next level, the third level. Jack, it's time to make a pizza. Please ladle the sauce on the pizza. If there's a correct response, I move over to the correct response column and go to the next, next step on the task analysis. If there's still not a correct response, then I go to that fourth level, which would be the controlling prompt, the one that's gonna reliably and consistently elicit the response that I want. And I'd say, hey, Jack, it's time to make a pizza. Let's ladle that sauce on the pizza. And then he would ladle the sauce on the pizza. So this is just an illustration of how one could use the system of least uh, prompts in an instructional, uh, in an instruction, an employment instructional setting. So once again, here's a data sheet. So when I'm collecting data on, uh, on uh, uh, least to most, I'm just keeping tra track of uh, the type of prompt that the individual uh, needed, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully they were going to have rapid acquisition uh, if we utilize the least to most prompting strategy efficiently. So I just keep track of whether the person, what prompt level the individual uh, completed each step on the task analysis. And what I hope to see is something like this if I graph my data, that we see an accelerating trend and that we get the person up to 100% accuracy on, on the steps of the task analysis. And typically, I've done a couple research studies on, uh, on uh, teaching people uh, in employment settings using a system of least to most prompts, and there's another strategy called the system of most, most to least prompts, uh, and typically when, when I'm implementing these strategies, we're seeing acquisition in pretty quick, pretty quick 10, tri 10 instructional trials, and individuals are maintaining that skill after instruction is stopped. So we know the stuff works if it's implemented uh, uh, systematically, and if we collect good solid data on, on uh, the outcome of instruction. So what strategy should you use? This is referring back to the study that I was just talking about. Uh, 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 I conducted a study in 2018 where we looked at different prompting strategies in employment settings. And what we found is that there's no correct strategy to use. Uh, typically, each uh, prompting strategy leads to the acquisition of an employment task. Uh, the, the learners that were included in this study, uh, you know, all acquired the task, all rapidly acquired the task uh, on, on each one of the prompting styles. So what we kind of surmised is that when we're thinking about what specific strategy to use, we're really going to look at the learning styles and preferences of the employee and the difficulty of the employment task, right? So if it's a really complex uh, task, we, we're going to maybe select uh, maybe the least to most prompting strategy because it might, uh, it provides a little bit more support. If the task isn't that difficult and there's, where the individual's just having some struggles on a couple of the steps on a task analysis, a constant time delay might be, uh, might uh, suffice. So you really have to look at the complexity of the task and going back to that learning style, you really have to consider, uh, you know, the learning style of the individual uh, that you're working with. 
And that goes back to the discovery process. So when you're uh, you know, engaged in discovery, you want to figure out uh, how best this person learns and how best this person responds. And then a second kind of uh, consideration is uh, staff training and knowledge of each prompting procedure. So this goes back to my initial assertion when I started this webcast that one of the things that we're seeing is that folks don't necessarily understand how to do uh, systematic instruction and utilizing some of these strategies. So, you know, we really have to consider who's implementing each one of these strategies and their understanding of how to implement them and how to complete, uh, complete uh, solid data collection systems. So staff training and knowledge is really important. And uh, the complexities of some of these prompting strategies, you know, some are more complex than others. And so we really have to consider staff knowledge and what they understand uh, about each one of these uh, specific prompting procedures. So what we know when we're thinking about instruction in customized employment is that we have to utilize uh, strategies that we know work. We have to utilize strategies that are based on empirical evidence and co uh, constant time delay and system of least to most prompts are both instructional strategies, are both response prompting strategies that, that are rooted in evidence, that there is research supporting the utility of each one of these models, each one of these instructional strategies. So we need to ensure that we're util utilizing those and teaching, uh, teaching an individual to uh, uh, learn uh, a new customized employment task or acquire a new customized employment task. So if you have questions about uh, any form of uh, instructional strategy or response prompting in particular, uh, feel free to contact me. My contact information is there. Uh, via email, I'll, I can respond to any questions. So I thank you for your time today, and uh, email me questions if you have them. Thank you, Dr. Reeson, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we now will pick up the question and answer phase with Heidi and Vicki. And I just, a couple of points before uh, Heidi and Vicki start answering all your questions. Uh, again, when, when they are done, uh, Jennifer goodluck clot will come on and explain about CRCs and a few other items. If by chance you need to leave the webinar before uh, Jennifer gets to that piece, there is an email you'll receive tomorrow with some of that information. Uh, and Jennifer will talk more about that after the Q&A piece. But again, if by chance you need to leave, uh, an email you'll receive tomorrow will have uh, information about the CRC. So with that, I will turn it over to Heidi and Vicki to answer your questions. And again, uh, feel free to you know, add, put questions in the Q&A box as well as those of you that may have already put an item there. So thanks. Uh, talk to everybody uh, at the, uh, actually Jen will, will close it up when she's done. So this is the last you'll hear from me today. Thanks a lot everybody for joining us and please join us for our future webinars. And with that, Heidi and Vicki, please take it away. Thanks, Terry. Sure appreciate it. Uh, that was a great presentation. There was a lot of information packed in there. We do have a couple of questions already. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's so great to have folks um, joining us and learning a little bit more with us each time. Just a reminder, we are putting on webinars just about every week. If you keep an eye on our Project E3 website, www.projecte3.com, uh, we'll be publicizing our upcoming webinars and um, other topics that we may have folks presenting. Um, I want to welcome Vicki Brook. She is one of our partners in Project E3, and she's here today to um, answer some of the questions that folks have about Tim's presentation. Vicki, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly and, and tell folks about yourself? Oh gosh, I don't want to bore them right out of the gate here. Um, <laughs> so um, my name is Vicki Brook, and I'm with uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. And I've been here for a very long time long before I ever had to dye my hair. Uh, <laughs> I was probably one of the country's original job coaches. So, um, so I've, I've been a job coach. I also manage, I do not manage, I should, that's a lie. I have um, 15 employment specialists that I work with. Uh, they probably manage me, um, who are doing this every single day 
So I feel very close to this content um, and I'm ready to take questions. Sounds fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. It seems a few of our questions are, are about um, the, the statement that Tim made about food and token economies. There seems to be con some concern around that. And um, one of our, our uh, watchers said, this is something that school parents and behavioral specialists use to ensure that a person completes tasks and learns tasks successfully. And another one of our respondents said, so is it wrong for, uh, for us to use food as this is the type of reinforcement that is used for one of my clients? Um, that the um, employment specialist is working with. Um, I think that that's, that's something that really has been used a lot in, in the past. And do, do you think that, is it recommended that um, that's discontinued if you already have it in, pro, in place with a consumer or is it something that you do starting moving forward with with any new consumers? Um, okay. Or do you, do you recommend that folks be um, weaned away from using that, that kind of reinforcement? Okay, so um, well, the first question was, is it wrong? I would have a hard time saying it's wrong. Um, just from, so you remember, you're, you're listening, it's Vicki Brooke, not Tim Risen. So he may have, a, he seemed very emphatic about no food, no token economy systems. Um, and this is what I'd say. We do work with a lot of young people coming out of school who may have gotten um, edible reinforcers in order to um, elicit the behavior that the teacher was looking for. Um, so they have become dependent upon this edible reinforcer. So handing somebody an M&M on a job site is just not appropriate. Um, but if that's, if, it, if that's what it takes initially, um, I have used sips of coffee because a coffee is something that, um, that would be typical in a work environment. I have used um, sips of soda um, if, if the person finds that reinforcing. So I have used that. Um, I want to move them from that um, edible to a, a, a more of a typical reinforcer, which would be um, good filling up the glasses or um, good ladling the sauce on the pizza. So I want to get them to respond and to be reinforced by verbal reinforcement, but I would have to take them from where they're at to where I want to get them to. So, so it can be a progression, so it doesn't- would use, would use the edible, um, I would not use M&Ms. I would use something that is typical in that environment. I would make sure the reinforcement is done discreetly. Um, but I would do it with, with a plan of how I'm going to get them from where they're at to where I want them to be at. Okay, that so it, can be, a more it can be a progression typical. rather than a, you right. know, just cut someone off. But I, because, can't, I can't do this right? because we're all about the whole thing about customized employment and supported employment is figuring out who they are, where they're at in space and time, figuring out their support needs are, and then providing that to, that that support, and then thinning the support. Or Tim talked about how we would fade the fade that support, which is typically instruction, but also the reinforcement will have to be thinned, and it's thinned. It's not completely faded because we all have reinforcement in our work environment. Um, you know, sometimes in some work environments, it's a lot thinner than other work environments, mm -hmm. but, but there's some level of reinforcement that is always going to be there. And maybe some of that we have to put into place. Sure. So, that, well, that, so the other I'm, piece of your question, I'm sorry. You were no, say. that's okay. It, it makes total sense. Uh, you don't want to pull something away if people are used to it, but it, so, it sounds like really making sure that any reward systems are contextually appropriate for the workplace um, is going to create less work for, uh, for you in the long run because um, you're, you're going to have uh, the behavior in place and you're going to have a contextually appropriate uh, reward system in place and um, that's a good way to do it discreetly so nobody gets cut off from um, a reinforcement that they're used to um, but that they are receiving reinforcements that are recognizable to them and I think 
sometimes um, just with my job, some of the reinforcement, um, it, it'll it sometimes come a lot at a time or, you know, sometimes there, there'll be a long stretch between times when a person on a job gets reinforcement. So I think that it, it sounds it sounds wise to move people from something that's that might be troublesome in a workplace to something that's going to to fit in better and not call attention to folks who are are trying to do a good job and 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 some and for some people they may need a higher level of reinforcement mm -hmm. so we may have to work with a coworker that is going to provide that intermittent reinforcement because that's what it's going to take to keep that uh, to keep that work performance going so we right. would we would set that up within the work environment. So we would we would send it as much as we can, but then we would go to a natural support for that. Super. The other thing that Tim talked about was um, a token economy system. Right. So for a lot of people, um, so you know, in the old days we would get. Oh, I don't know, but I don't know how many old days there are for people out there. <laughs> but we used to, hey folks, we used to get a paper. Uh, check that was our paycheck and it would be it would be like sometimes on like card stock and it'd be in a cute little envelope Well, that didn't happen anymore. No, so um, it was hard even when you would receive like um, a paper paycheck mm -hmm. so Now we don't even receive that it just ends up in our bank. So For a lot of our folks we have to teach them that the paycheck is the reinforcer Mm -hmm. They're not going to come to competitive integrated employment thinking like, yeehaw, it's a paycheck. You know, my mama buys me whatever I want to. Um, so lots of times we have to teach um, how, the, how the paycheck's reinforcing. So if you don't get paid until every two weeks, there may be intermittent reinforcement that they're going to get before the paycheck. You know, so they save it up. So on paycheck day, they can go out and um, maybe get their, their nails done. I don't know, I've gone shopping with guys who are buying wrestling magazines, um, but you're gonna find those intermittent reinforcements. So they, so they start connecting um, the, the reinforcer with the paycheck. So it, and it'll be based upon um, work performance. And that seems like an experience-based um, experience a uh, work thing where you know you need to associate the paycheck with the rewards that the paycheck can get you and that's that can be a little bit of an abstract concept for folks until they've had a chance to actually spend some of the money from their check and, and see what kind of rewards um, since you don't get paid the moment you do the work I, I'm sure that that's something that folks need to uh, practice a couple of times before they're used to that actually being being a tangible reward for them so that that totally makes sense but I guess the the point that Tim was making and um, and maybe if he's here he would clarify it too um, even if you do put that token economy system in place you're gonna have to it has to be um, pulled out I mean you're gonna have right. to you have to know when you do that where are you going when mm -hmm. you know how do you get out of that? You, it doesn't continue forever and ever and ever. Right. Well, I think we'll move on to the next question. Actually, I do have the PowerPoint up. Lisa Larson is asking, please clarify again the difference between the prompted level V and the prompt level M. So the implementation instruction, um, the levels go from the, the most comprehensive is uh, FP for full physical, then there's PP for partial physical. Um, then towards the middle is M for model. And then DV, D -V, sorry guys, um, DV for direct verbal. And then IV for indirect verbal. And then G for gesture. Uh, Lisa, if that didn't answer your question, uh, just pop, a, pop another question into the, um, into the Q&A. But I think, I think that's what she was asking. Um, so I'll, I'll just demonstrate the whole the whole sequence if that super. might be helpful for that's everybody. That's great. So, um, so your task analysis should be written as the verbal prompt. So lots of people in pre-service programs like BCU and other universities um, had in the past really taught um, how to develop a task analysis that might have a lot of language in it. I want to be able to, as an employment specialist on a job site, 
I want to be able to look down at my task analysis and I want to make sab the same verbal prompt every single time. So I would write, pick up the ladle, pick up the tomato sauce, pour the tomato sauce, spread, spread the tomato sauce with the ladle. Those would be four separate steps mm -hmm. and they would be written, my task analysis would be written that way. So a verbal prompt would be, pick up the label. An indirect verbal prompt would be, Heidi, what's the next step? So I haven't given her the information and I'm gonna see if she has the, has the information. Right. Um, so the verbal prompt was the direct verbal prompt. That was the mm -hmm. DP, pick up the ladle. Modeling would be, Heidi, pick up the ladle like this. And I would pick up the label, the ladle. Um, then I would wait and see if Heidi picked up the label, ladle and I would count a thousand one, a thousand two, a thousand three. I wouldn't count it out loud. I'd kind of count it in my head. But I'm, <laughs> I'm counting. After a while, you just know what it is. But you know, right. when you're when you start doing this, you will count it out in your head. So partial physical assistance would be I might take Heidi's hand and just like tap her tap her wrist, um, and I would pair it with the verbal prompt. Heidi, pick up the ladle, and see if that elicits the response. If it did, then that would be a P, um, uh, partial PP, partial physical assistance. If I, if that still didn't do it, I put my hand over hand, pick it, pick up the ladle like this, Heidi, and we would do it together. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you give that much physical assistance, like the full hand over hand, or even the, the, tapping of the wrist or tapping of the elbow, you then have to go back up that hierarchy. Right. So you would never want to provide that much assistance unless that's really what it required in order for the individual to elicit the response you wanted. Sure. So you want to start at the top and make sure that you can't get what you want just with a direct verbal prompt right? or a modeling prompt. And so a gesture would be, just pointing to the ladle and say, you know, pick up the ladle. And I just point to the ladle. That mm -hmm. would be, a, and, if, and if Heidi did it that way with that, with that prompting, you would record a G. Did okay. I do that correctly? It did, did that help? Let us know if that didn't help. Yeah, uh, we do have somebody who asked a little bit more detailed question about the, the ladle example um, in terms of, labeling um, uh, uh, what you're going to mark down for the, the prompting. Using the ladle example, if the person consistently picks up the ladle, but um, maybe gets too much or too little sauce in it, is that considered not correct? Or it's a partial correct and the instruction is given again um, until they get the correct amount of sauce and the ladle before applying? How, okay, how so would that work? So what I would then do is insert another step in the task analysis. And so that step would be, um, um, if I'm putting sauce in the ladle, then it's like, I need to have a step in there to say how full, how much sauce you put in the label. So um, fill, the, fill the ladle halfway with sauce. You see what I mean? So then I've yeah. already, I've taken care of that step. I had to add another step to the task analysis. Right. And it seems to be some of these, some of these tasks, you know, I've heard the saying, you can't, you have to eat an elephant one spoonful at a time. You have to break down gigantic tasks into subtasks. Um, you know, it's a, it's a thing that I think we probably run into ourselves during project management. You don't just um, produce webinar. There are different steps that go into that. And each of those steps has to be, um, kind of detailed out so that your team can do everything uh, smoothly together. But so, I think that's a really good point. But the problem on a job site is that you, you could develop a task analysis that is just not efficient. So mm -hmm. you could break, you could have um, 40 steps to a task analysis that's just not going to be efficient for an employment specialist to use. Right. So I would rather to err on fewer steps and then run into that problem um, that was just pointed out. What about 
you know, they don't put the right uh, quantity, then mm -hmm. I know I need to insert another step in the task analysis. Sure. And, and then that becomes part of my instruction. So you kind of walk, and, okay, so this is why you can't buy a textbook and have all those right. task analysis and just use them like as a recipe book. Mm -hmm. Because every work site is different. Every client is different. I could teach four different clients to do the same task and they're going to have a different task analysis because right. I'm going to develop the task analysis based upon their own individual support needs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Variables. Those variables. Yeah. You have to make sure that it's contextually appropriate and right for the person as well. So. Yeah, and I think it's different how you provide well, it is. It's very different how you provide instruction in a classroom and how you provide mm -hmm. instruction on a job site. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, Danielle Smith has a question. Was this presentation based on a particular customized employment model? Well, he was talking about customized employment in general, and, he, and then he would intermittently use um, supported employment. But whether you're doing customized employment or supported employment, the job site training phase is going to look the same way. The um, because here it is, folks. Good instructions, good instruction, good instruction. So you're going to provide the same type of uh, work-based instructional strategies, whether it's support employment or customized employment. I think that probably answers Danielle's question. If it didn't, Danielle, go ahead and pop another question in the QA for us. Um, the next one we have, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, well, we had a technical question. So, um, and then somebody thanking us for the presentation. So uh, those are great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw out a call for any more questions and, um, I think just out of curiosity for myself, um, can you tell me what, um, what error correction might, might look like? Um, a place that I, that I worked at before was working on um, people, children who had, um, you know, were acting out in the classroom um, and kind of was one of the, one of the theories was, is, you know, you teach, kids math and you teach kids English, but maybe they didn't get taught behavior appropriate to the academic environment. So um, you're trying to teach them the behaviors. And this sounds like a s similar thing. If you're doing error correction, how do you reteach that behavior? And what would that look like um, before being on a job site? And what would that look like maybe on a job site? So it looks very different when it's in the classroom is what I'll say. You, you, mm -hmm. have, you, you can do um, a, a variety of things. When you're on the job site, what I, want, what I want to make sure is employment specialists, this isn't the only person they're serving. This right. is the person they're serving right now. Mm -hmm. And there's expectations for them to be able to be very efficient with their time um, because Department of Rehab Services who may be paying for them for their hourly rate or uh, Medicaid waiver, they want them to be able to, and also for our client, we don't want them to become dependent upon the employment specialist to be sure. efficient with their time and to pay from their job site. So I do not want my new employee to learn an error because if they learn the error, mm -hmm. they have to unlearn it and relearn the correct way. So I've got, I've already then I have more time I have to invest. Right. So as soon as I see the error, I want to interrupt it immediately. Mm -hmm. And, and begin instruction right there. So I and how would, would you do that? I would. I mean, uh, it example. could be, um, and it wouldn't be part of your. Um, you, it's. It can be part of your data collection. It's mm -hmm. not part of what we were shown uh, today. But I would just interrupt it if um, if there was um, filling glasses with water and the water spreading all over. You know, I'm going to um, take the picture away and then I'm going to set it aside, and then I'm going to find time to provide clean, systematic instruction. Mm -hmm. So um, you would do it, you would interrupt the error any way that is um, appropriate in that setting, but just to stop, um, stop the work. So typically, it's not generally a behavior. Mm -hmm. It's just you're doing the task incorrectly. Right. 
So it, it really is more of, of instruction. If it's an issue of behavior, that's going to look very different than what Tim is talking about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in, in those situations, I suppose that it, it's also going to not only depend on the work environment, but also what the person responds best to. And like Tim was saying, that you find out a lot of that in discovery. So um, you really do. You really find out the kinds of um, the kinds of not only discovery helps us to direct the job search, but mm -hmm. it really helps us for instruction on the job site, what they like, what they don't like, what they respond to. You do not want to use um, um, hand over hand or any kind of physical prompting with somebody with perhaps autism who is very tactile defensive. Right. I mean, you're going to create a whole issue for yourself. So right. that kind of information you really need on the front end. Mm -hmm. We don't have any more questions. I I have um I have I have something I could share. Is there more questions? Right now we don't. Um I, so there I don't. is there is an assessment strategy that Tim did not talk about. Um and it's called um probe data. So has anybody heard of probe data? Okay, no. All right, so I'll just talk about it. <laughs> so there's this there's this strategy that you would then use your task analysis. So you have that in your lab. So you provided instruction all week. And I just want to take a quick and dirty assessment of where they're at in learning this particular task. So without any prompting and without any reinforcement, and this is the really hard part for employment specialists, because we like to provide that reinforcement. We like to say, doing a nice job, or good picking that up, or good doing that. So you'd have to like, uh, so if there's somebody like me who likes to do, uh, I usually, as an employment specialist, would have, um, I would wear clothing with pockets. So I'd have my hands down in a way. Um, and without any prompting and reinforcement, I would find out exactly how much of that task analysis that they can complete independently. Mm -hmm. Why without any prompting or reinforcement? Because ultimately, that's where we're going with this individual. Right. So I, and it also shows me exactly where to begin my instruction. Sure. So Tim talked about um, um, not having to provide instruction on the whole task because you're going to zero in on certain tasks that are certain steps that the individual um, is really having trouble with. Well, the probe data helps you know exactly where where to begin instruction. And uh, Vicki, is there is there a site or someplace that folks can go to if they want to get more information on that? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, we can. Um, can I send you something? Heidi, Absolutely. Could, yeah, I'll send we can you include something. it in the email that we'll send out to everybody um, tomorrow with the information on getting their CRC. So we can include any extra resources that you'd like to share with folks in that. Um, yeah, I can send that, more detailed information. On that sounds great. Yeah. yeah, and definitely it sounds like that's the end point that you want people to get to is to be able to do that sequence without any without any prompting and you know you need to do that gradual sort of release of responsibility from you to the the person so exactly. that they can make it through their tasks um, on their own and um, I think with all of us we just whether whether or not you're uh, you have an obstacle like a disability there are parts of our jobs that it takes a while to learn or parts that you're better at and parts that you have to take more time with. Um, and it, it makes sense just from a general perspective too that um, getting folks where they need to be in order to do their jobs well, um, it doesn't happen overnight. So yep. um, doing that, being patient and finding out what works best with your folks, um, that, that also is a value, um, you know, it's kind of a reward to be able to do it well and get through a sequence and be able to, you know, get the reinforcement. Yeah, you did that right. Um, I do have a few more questions that have come in. Edwin has asked, can the task analysis be for a consumer who is simply needing assistance with job skills training? In this case, the consumer is not receiving customized employment nor supported employment services. Absolutely. So, I use task analysis with my husband all the time. <laughs> Tell me how that works. <laughs> yeah, it's, the, it's the reinforcer that you have to pay a pay right. attention to. Yeah. <laughs> this is how you load the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. uh, um, oh, yeah, good job I unloading mean, the dishwasher that way. <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, seriously, good, it's just good instruction. I mean, mm -hmm. um, 
if, if it's uh, not one of our clients, then it, it may have fewer steps in the task analysis, but it's still, I mean, when you got, when you learn how to uh, operate your, your, your computer for the first time, all those books are written in task analysis. Mm -hmm. Step one, step two, step yep. three. So yeah. Yeah, I come from a technical writing background, so um, yeah. I actually enjoy writing the task analysis for running a website for our folks who are backing us up. It's it's kind of fun for me. That's a, that's the intrinsic reward for me is being able to write a, a task analysis. So um, <laughs> um, let's see here. We have Teresa asking, uh, and this might be a question Jen Gunlachlot for you. Are there any training materials readily available? already that we could use to provide training to our staff on the two strategies Tim presented. Um, of course, we're going to send along the PowerPoint as a PDF um, that was in the chat. It will also be on our website afterwards. The full recording of, of this webinar training will be available. Um, it, it takes a little while because we have everything captioned and we have to upload um, and things like that. So there are the technical things that we need to clean up on our end. But uh, any of the things that you learn here, um, we're, we welcome you to use them. We encourage you to use them. Uh, we wanted to make sure this uh, webinar series is um, is something that people can can take out and directly apply. It's it's kind of a, an applied learning model for for mm -hmm. all of our our folks. So um, the things that come in the email tomorrow, Teresa, if you're looking for something beyond that, um, after you've looked at the materials and everything that we send you through the mail tomorrow, through the email tomorrow, um, maybe you could reach out to us and and let us know a little bit more specifically what you're looking for. But um, we do share all this information. Um, the PowerPoint is turned into a PDF. You can share that with folks. Um, but I think that's, that's um, that's how I can answer that for now. And if it doesn't um, suit your needs, then uh, we can get you more information. Uh, Brian asks, where's this video uploaded? We upload all of our videos to the Project E3 website. Um, like I mentioned before, www.projecte, and then the number three, Dot com and we have a tab on the top that says webinars and webcasts so if you click on there it will tell you about our upcoming webinars and it will tell you about our archived webinars so actually we have over a dozen really good videos um, like this one that that you can access anytime that you want to so again that's www.projecte3.com and then web the webcasts webinars um, tab on the top that that will get you where you need to go. I think that information is probably in the email that um, Jen is going to send out to um, just in case people didn't have their pens ready to go. Um, so I think that takes care of the questions that we have in the question and answer queue. Um, Vicki, is there anything else that you want to share with your experience as having been, you know, a, a job coach for such a long time that that you think um, maybe newer people would benefit from? Anything that you can can share that that builds on what Tim had to say today? I, I Tim provided a lot of information. You're you're not going to use those strategies on the job site and immediately feel comfortable. Right. So it takes time to, and not too scary, but it probably takes like a good year of applying those skills on a job site to feel really comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so it does kind of feel uncomfortable. Um, Tim talked about data. Um, so I often ask employment specialists, do you think it's a luxury to collect data? If you don't have a task analysis and you're not collecting data, you will not know how to phase. You might have a feeling like, um, God, I think Heidi's doing better today. But if I had data, I would know Heidi moved from a modeling prompt to a gesture. Learning's mm -hmm. occurring. She had a right. less intrusive prompt. Unless you wrote that down, I doubt whether you would know that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, so if you're dealing is, with more than one consumer, you can't probably yeah, remember all of it for site, everybody. You're going to go to another job site, and mm -hmm. you know, then you're going to start this process again with this person tomorrow. <laughs> so, you, uh, an employment specialist has a lot of things going on. Um, you won't know how to fade. So, it and it's all about 
providing really clean, clear instructions so you can fade from that job site as they become more proficient. And you mm -hmm. don't want them to become dependent upon you and you right. stay too long at a job site. Mm -hmm. So data is not a luxury. It's really critical to the process. You don't always feel comfortable with that, but you're going to have these little um, nasty data sheets, depending on where you're at, and they're going to be folded up and in your pocket. Um, and you're going to pull it out and make some notes. So when you leave, if you have a lot of people around you, you're not making a big thing of collecting data. Right. But you're getting the information. Yeah. That sounds great. Vicki, thank you so much for answering the questions and for sharing your experiences with us. It's a, it was a great opportunity to have you, um, have you visit with us. Uh, I do have one more question in the Q&A, but I think that um, I'll have Jen maybe address that when she's talking about the CEUs. Amy's asking about CEUs for archived webinars that we have on our website. Um, asking about the the time frame for getting the CEUs for that. But before I close out, I just want to say, Vicki, thanks again so much. It was a pleasure having you. Um, it was you have 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 such great insight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jen and she will talk about um, some of the CEU opportunities. Um, so over to you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you thanks, you bet. Um, Vicki, I actually have one more question in the chat box. They are asking if you have data collection sheets available. I will, I will send um, uh, a data collection sheet along with the other information that I sent to Heidi uh, great. on probe data. Yep. Okay, great. We'll add it to our resources then. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and then for the Q&A box, there was the question about how long it takes to receive the, the CRCs. Um, it could take up to four to six weeks, but maybe it'll take one day. Um, just be, be patient with us. It takes a while to go through all those. I, um, so if you are in need of the CRC for today's webcast, the link I just added to the chat box contains steps to request the CRC. This can also be found on our webcast page within our website at projecte3.com. You will also receive an email tomorrow with these instructions. All of our webcasts are archived along with any additional resources listed and worth one CRC. These can be found on our website. And let me add that to the chat box as well for you all. There. Um, and a reminder that next week's webcast is What is a Job Coach? An overview of the role of a job coach in the workplace, which is on Thursday, February 13th at 11 a.m. Central Time. So thanks for joining us today, and we hope you all enjoyed today's webcast. Thanks a lot, everybody.